those of you here in the room, we're going to worship together. And those of you online, let's do it.
Jesus, we love you. God, we are here for you to magnify your name, to lift you high. God, to say again that you are Lord and that you are in control. God, we place you on the throne of our lives again this morning. We're here to worship you and to honor you. God, I'm so grateful that you're near. God, that you're here with us and that you know us all so deeply and so intimately. God, I'm thankful for the promises and the blessings that you've poured out for us. God, that we get to live our lives in and live our lives on. We love you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Amen.
children, and their children, and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family, in your children, and their children, and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you. Boy. 
Come on, church. Let's give Jesus some praise. Come on. Can we get loud real quick? Come on. Amen. Amen. Hey, before we sit down, we told you about this new thing last week that we're going to start doing every single Sunday here at Grace. It's not just a trend, okay? It's not going to die. We're going to keep it going. Um, we're going to have a moment of prayer uh, right after worship every Sunday. And so what we've been doing is there's a number on the screen that you can see when you come in during worship. Um, and it's a number that you can text for prayer requests. So whether you're joining us online today, which we love you and we're so glad you're here, or if you're here in person, which we love you too, and we are so, we are so glad that you're here as well, um, you have an opportunity to send in a prayer request. Because here at Grace Fellowship Church, we truly, truly believe in the power of prayer. Amen. And we know that the best way that we can fight our battles, the way that we fight our battles here is by surrendering all of the things that we are going through at the feet of Jesus. And so we want to do that today. We want to be here for our brothers and sisters who have prayer requests, who are going through stuff. And we want to lift these requests up to our Heavenly Father who loves us and cares for us so much. So we're going to continue that today. And just to remind you, these are anonymous. So whatever you got, bring it. Bring it. Give it to God. Let him, do, let, him, let him do what only he can do. Let him have his way in these things. We're joining you. We're believing that God is going to do amazing things. So come on, church. Let's pray real quick. Jesus, we thank you for today. God, we thank you that we have the honor, God, and the privilege to be here in your house today, God, to worship you, Jesus, to lift your name on high with all that we have and all that we are. So Jesus, from the get-go, that's what I want to pray, God. That's my prayer request for today, Jesus, is that every single person in this room, God, whatever they're going through, Whatever life is throwing their way, God, that we all surrender it to you, Jesus. That you have your way in our lives, God. That you become Lord of all of our lives, God. That you are King of kings, Jesus. I pray that you take reign in our hearts today, God. Take it all. Have it all, Jesus. And Lord, right now we want to lift up our family, God, who are, who are going through things, God. Who are, we're so excited, Lord, that they are, they're coming to you, God. That they've been invited into your throne, Lord, at your feet to, to offer these things up to you and say, God, I need your help. Because you are the difference maker. You are the loving father, God. You are the miracle worker, and we trust you. So today, Lord, we lift these up to you. Lord, somebody is praying for the health and wellness and safety of all the teachers and students who are jumping into school this year. We thank you for our schools, God. We thank you for our teachers. We thank you for our students, God. And we just ask that this school year, no matter what's going on in the world, is the best school year yet, Jesus. We believe that that can happen because that's the kind of God that you are. So, Lord, we surrender this school year to you. We thank you and ask that you are protecting teachers, protecting students as they get back into school, that you bless them, Lord, um, wherever they are, whether that's in a school or at home, whatever it looks like, Jesus, that this year is going to be amazing for them, God. We surrender that to you, and we ask that you just make that happen, God, that you bless them all, God, that you're protecting, you're providing, and you're making this school year a brand new year where we all grow, where teachers grow, where students grow, to be more like you, to be, become the best versions of ourselves that you've created us to be, Jesus. We thank you for that. We thank you for this year. God, somebody else is praying for, for students who are, co- who are becoming college students, God, seniors in high school who are now jumping into a, a fall semester in college, God, and who are becoming adults, who are adults now, God, and who are taking on life. And Lord, as they tr- make this transition, as they jump into the world, God, and they're starting to make their own decisions, God, and as they become more independent, Jesus, we pray that you just give them all the wisdom that they need. We pray that you give them the, the discernment and the strength that they need. Lord, we pray that you surround them, God, and, and give them the support that they need as they jump into this year, Lord. And most importantly, Jesus, for these students, for these brand new college students, we pray that they never stop trusting you. We pray that they look to you with all that they have and all that they are. And as they have to make adult decisions now, from now on, God, and as they have to figure things out, that you give them all the support they need from those around them. God, let them know that they are loved, that you are with them. Give them all that they need. Lord, we thank you for these next, these next leaders who are coming up right now, God. Have your way in their lives. Let them, one, one more, God, if somebody's praying for healing and marriage today, Jesus, we thank you for relationships, Jesus. We thank you that you are a relational father. And God, we pray over the marriages that are going on right now, this specific marriage, God. We pray for whatever situation is happening, whatever brokenness is there, Lord, that it is repaired in your name, Jesus. That you just bring healing, Jesus. That you bring true love, the love that you intended for, ma- to, for marriages to have, Jesus, to be in the midst of marriage. We pray that is restored in your name, Jesus. That these relationships are built up and that husband and wife look to you with all that they have and they are. And they trust you, Jesus. That they desire you above each other, God, so in, in turn, Lord, they can become closer together. So they can have the marriage, have a marriage the way you created it to be, Jesus. Have your way in that marriage, Lord. Bring healing. We thank you that you are the healer. We love you. We trust you. And we praise you. Have your way in these, Jesus. It's in your matchless name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Well, church, can we give Jesus another shout of praise real quick? Come on. It's a good Sunday here at Grace Fellowship Church. 
And we are so, so excited to have you with us. You guys can take your seats. Again, thank you for joining us today. If you are online, thank you so much for being with us. We love you. We love you. We love you. We are so excited to, to have you with us today. We've got a great service planned. We've actually got some stuff that we want to share with you guys that is happening at Grace Fellowship Church. Um, so if you would please take a look at your screens. Hey, Grace Fellowship. Good morning. So good to be with you. Even though I'm just looking at a camera right now, you guys all look fantastic, and it's great to be with you. A couple of things I want you to know about. If this is your first time at Grace Fellowship Church, first off, a huge welcome to you. We're so, so glad that you're here. Hope that you feel welcome to feel at home. If you wouldn't mind doing me a quick favor, though, and look in that seat back right in front of you, you'll find a blue card in there. That's our communication card. If you would grab that and fill that out, it just helps us to help you when it comes to next steps here at Grace Fellowship. So grab that card and fill it out. Another thing it does, as always, is we've partnered with a ministry called Tender Mercies, and they help feed families in need. And for every first-time guest card that's turned in, we make a donation on your behalf to that ministry. And we're getting really, really close to 2,000 families that have been fed, which is so awesome. So thank you guys for doing that. If you're a first-time guest, all you have to do is put your name on that card and turn it in at the Connect Desk. If you're watching online right now and it's your first time, uh, you can just text the phrase, feed a family to the number below, and you get a form back that's the exact same thing as that card, and you get to be a part of feeding families too. So thank you so much and welcome to Grace Fellowship. Next thing is tithes and offering. If you brought a tithe or an offering, there's a few different ways for you to give that this morning. If you're in the building right now, uh, you can uh, go to the back of the sanctuary. We've got black boxes back there where you can do cash or check giving. And you can also just give online on our website or you can text the amount that you wanna give uh, to the number 84321. So thank you for giving, thanks for being generous. We love you. Uh, a couple of things we want everybody to know about. You just saw Pastor Ricky come up here and he did a prayer moment. This is gonna be something that we do every single week. Uh, we believe in the power of prayer and we wanna be a church that prays and prays for each other. Uh, so you saw on your screen, you saw uh, you, could, you could text the word need him to the number that was right there. Uh, if you guys have a prayer request, something that you want prayer for, text that number, text need him to that number and you'll get a link back. Click on that link or tap on that link and there's gonna be a little form that you fill out and there's a, a spot there for your prayer request. So put that prayer request in there and then we're gonna take time every single week to look through those and pray for some of those on the platform but we've got a whole team of people that prays for those requests. So text that word need him to the number on the screen and we'd love to pray for you. Thank you uh, for doing that. Last thing, we just had summer jam and it was incredible. So much fun. Uh, so many kids were, were here and got to worship and talk about Jesus and have a great time together. So we're gonna look at a highlight reel right now from summer jam. So let's check that out. I just love on a year like this that we did not let COVID stop the, the Grace Kids ministry from doing Summer Jam. I love seeing the triangles. I love kids in masks worshiping God um, against COVID, right? Isn't that awesome? Love it. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much that with all that's going on in our world this year, Lord, uh, we just got some precious people around this church that still wanted to provide this opportunity for kids. We thank you that the the gospel of Jesus was shared, and that it was shared amidst color and fun and excitement and music, Lord. 
God, I pray that the, the seeds sown in young hearts this last week uh, would bring about great fruit and life change in them. Lord, as we go into this morning's message right now, um, Lord, I pray for a blessing over this congregation, Lord, uh, both in person and online. Jesus, I pray that you would open up our hearts right now, Lord. Some of these things, Lord, that we need to believe about you and that we need to walk in, they're big changes. And Lord, it's, it's going to take us trusting you, and it's going to take a miracle inside of our souls. So Jesus, would you come and do that miracle? In Christ's name, amen. 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 My name's Josh Trueblood, and uh, one of the pastors here at Grace, and it's a privilege to be with you guys. This is week three, three um, of our new series, uh, The Third Option. And uh, we've been talking about this really difficult topic of racism for a couple of weeks, and you guys have been hanging in there with us, and I've been getting so many great uh, messages from you guys and letters from you guys, and you're hanging in there with us, so thank you for that. Today is another doozy. Are you ready? It's another doozy. Okay, so let me start with this. Um, When I was younger, uh, maybe you did this, um, I remember times when maybe a certain glass or porcelain object got broken. Not that I broke it, but it got broken. And um, it it was, I I wanted to glue it. And and I I wanted to glue it not just to repair it. I wanted to glue it in such a way that the original breakage was invisible. Do you ever do that? And and you're sitting there with the, uh, you know, the the super glue and and, and you're trying to get the pieces in there just right so that if mom comes and finds this later, she may not know that this even happened. You ever do that? A, a few of you are, are uh, honest this morning. Um, there is a special art form in Japan, and it is known as kintsugi. Say it, kintsugi, right? You learned a new word, kintsugi. And, and the idea there is that when pottery breaks, what they do is they come and they fill the cracks in as they repair that pottery. They fill it in with special substances like gold in some cases. And, and when they fill it in, they do it intentionally to where you can see where the cracks are. And, and it's such an art form that sometimes that broken pottery that's been repaired is considered more valuable than the original piece of pottery was. So this art form, what they've done is they figured out a way to embrace brokenness and to see the beauty that is in that brokenness. So here's what the devil has done. See, the enemy has come and used the sin and and the cancer of racism in our country to divide us, to shatter us, to even break the church. That is what the enemy wanted all along. But Christ has come to fill in the gaps. And to fill in in the gaps, not in a self-denial kind of a way where we approach this problem, we approach this brokenness, and we try to pretend like it's not there. That never works, does it? Instead, we admit that it's there. Instead, we come humbly. And we say, you know what? If I let Jesus see the cracks, he'll fill it with himself. And maybe beauty will come out of the brokenness. Amen? Amen. That's that's what he has for us. Now... uh, the first two weeks were challenging. Today's going to be even more challenging. So do I have your permission to get messy today? I need to hear that about three times louder. Do I have your permission to get messy today? Because this is going to get messy and I need your permission. I need your permission. I need you to sit up straight. Even you folks at home, I need you to sit up straight in your seats. I need you to lean forward a bit like I'm expecting movement all across the room right now. All right, this is not lean back and take it easy. This is big stuff. You're going you're gonna, you're gonna to want to listen to these words very, very specifically. I'm going to be very careful in what I say, but this stuff is meant to push us because I believe that many of the areas where we need to grow, we need to allow Jesus to come in and fill our gaps, and that's not necessarily going to be easy to do. We've got to open ourselves up and be humble about what he might want to say to us, so I'm going to press. A couple review points from last week, because we said a lot last week, and I want to make sure that we don't miss them and, and scoot along too quickly. First review point is racism and bias are two different things. Do you remember that? We defined those two terms last week, and now why, why was that important? Because racism and bias are two different things, and sometimes in our culture, we use them simultaneously. Um, or not so, well, we use them interchangeably is, is a better word. We use them interchangeably. Um, racism is the confirmed belief that one race is superior to other races. 
It's that confirmed belief. You know that belief is there. Uh, and, and because you believe that one race is superior to other races, there, there may be racist words and racist actions that flow out of that confirmed belief that you know is there. That's racism. But there's also bias. And bias may be this thing where you don't believe the tenets of racism, but sometimes you have a hidden bias. Sometimes you even know it's there. Sometimes people have to tell you that it's there. Sometimes we have all these biases that we got from growing up, people that influence us, a culture that influenced us, our political party that influenced us. A lot of things can influence us, and we can have those hidden biases across our lives. And if you have not arrived yet, like I have not arrived yet, you may find as you go along your life that there are hidden biases that keep cropping up and you have to deal with as they crop up. Let me give you an example. Um, a couple months ago, we had a gutter crew come out and replace all the gutters on our house because we had had a hailstorm out there and it damaged them. They needed to be replaced. And this was a, a crew of about 10 people. And most of the people on this crew were Latino. And I remember uh, meeting a few of them and talking to a few of them at the beginning of the job. And, and from what I could tell, most of them could not speak English. So I drew that conclusion really fast. And at one point, there was a mistake made on the job and the house got scratched a little bit. And I wanted to talk to somebody about getting the, the house repaired in that way. And, and I looked around and, and what I did is I assumed that none of the Latino people there could speak English. And I went looking for a white guy. And there was a white guy on the crew. And I went and I found the white guy. And assuming he could speak English, and he could speak English, and we started talking about the issue, but he was not the, the person on the ladder at the time. And the person who was on the ladder where the mistake had been made overheard us talking, and oh, by the way, he was Latino and he spoke English. And he walked over to me with kind of a smile on his face and just started talking to me about what had happened. Am I a racist? But... Could I have done that better? Like if I, if I could go back and do that better, I, I, I would love to have, to have realized that I just projected something I saw in a few people. I attached it to their skin color and I projected it across the whole group of them. I wish I hadn't done that. I wish that that, that, that guy hadn't had to go through that discomfort with me in the way that he did. See, when the Holy Spirit comes, and, and some of you are like, well, that's not that big of a deal. But the standard isn't that it's not that big of a deal. The standard is that we love people. The standard is that we treat people with as much respect and love as we possibly can. And when the Holy Spirit comes to me and says, there's a little issue here, Josh. You could have done this better. Do I deny it? Do I try to glue those two pieces back together and pretend that they aren't there? Or do I say, Jesus, come on in. Come on in and correct me and make me better. Do you want him to make you better today? Yes. Amen. Amen. Next point to review from last week. We owe our loyalty to God alone. This is the third option. If you remember the, the passage that we read in Scripture, is out of the book of Joshua. Last week, Joshua goes to the angel the night before the battle of Jericho. And, and, and he says to the angel, he says, are you for us, the Israelites? Are you for our enemies? He gives them two ap options. Hamburger or hot dog? And the angel says, neither. Angel says, neither. He says, but I command the armies of the Lord. And Joshua says, then I'm your servant. See, there, there's a third option. And the third option is that you don't give your loyalty to the Republicans and you don't give it to the Democrats. You give it to God alone. Right? I don't care who the groups are. You're like, well, those aren't my two groups. I don't care who the groups are. You give it to God alone. He's always the third option, no matter what. He's always the third option, and he's the one who deserves your loyalty today. There's an article that Pastor Tim Keller wrote in the New York Times. It was an opinion piece. Wonderful pastor. I follow a lot of what this guy does. Um, several years back, he wrote a, an article called, How Do Christians Fit into the Two-Party System? They Don't. That was the title. Here's a small excerpt from it. He says, another reason Christians these days cannot allow the church to be fully identified with any particular political party is the problem of what British ethicist James Mumford calls package deal ethics. Say package deal ethics. It feels like a college class, doesn't it? Package deal ethics. Increasingly, political parties insist that you cannot work on one issue with them if you don't embrace all of their approved positions. This emphasis on package deals puts pressure on Christians in politics. Have you ever felt that pressure? 
I agree with these things, but not these things. And am I, am I a sellout if I don't agree with the whole thing? For example, he says, following both the Bible and the early church, Christians should be committed to racial justice and the poor, but also to the understanding that sex is only for marriage and for nurturing family. One of these views seems liberal, and the other looks oppressively conservative. The historical Christian position on social issues does not fit into contemporary political alignments. You don't fit. Biblically, we don't fit. And we shouldn't feel like we fit. And if it feels too much like we fit, maybe something's wrong. Do you agree that black lives matter? Some of you, that's an easy question. Some of you, it's harder. It's more complicated. See, if, if, if I was to talk about, does every single black life matter? Yes. Not only do they matter, but they are made in the image of God, which means his breath was breathed into them, which means that they carry immeasurable value and dignity as people, and they must be treated as such. They don't just matter, they're valuable. Black lives matter. But, but for some of us, when that phrase is used, our mind doesn't go to the truth of God's word. It goes to a political group. And it starts to feel complicated. So for me to say that every black life matters, to, does, does that mean that I agree with the movement called Black Lives Matter? Because maybe some of us have gone out to their website and we've read their political platform. And all the tenants of that, and we saw some of those tenants on that political platform did not line up with scripture as far as we're concerned. And if you felt that way, then when someone says, do black lives matter, you get kind of, ah. You ever feel that? Ah. I'm a, ah. It gets messy. Philippians 3, 19b says this. Their, their mind, talking about unbelievers, is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is third option. It says your loyalty, your allegiance, the blessings and the rights of your life, they do not come from any of those groups. They come from God alone. And so your citizenship is in heaven. You're like, but I'm an American citizen. Yes, you are. But your ultimate citizenship is in heaven is what that verse is saying. Your ultimate loyalty goes to God alone, which means whenever they conflict, you choose to be a sellout to your group so that you can be loyal to God. I will choose to be a sellout. You might admire Martin Luther King. You might admire Mother Teresa, but they did not die for you, so they do not deserve your ultimate loyalty. You might admire Donald Trump. You might admire Barack Obama, but they did not die for you. So they do not deserve your ultimate loyalty. Another review point, give your heart to people that are in your out group. Remember we talked about this last week, that, that, that we couldn't just agree with the truth that people were equal, ethnicities were equal. We have to actually love people. That's choosing the third option, is to proactively, with action, love people. Give your heart away to people who are in your out group. It's so, so important. Um, here's one example of that. After third service last week, this was an amazing thing that happened. After third service last week, uh, most of you had filed out and I was sitting over there in the corner and there was a, a couple that came up to talk to me and said, Pastor, we need to chat with you for a second. And, and they were a black couple and they're leaders here at our church. And, and they sat down with me and they said, you know, we just wanted to talk about this series because we realized today that we came into this series on the third option, assuming this was an, a, a series that you were going to teach to the white people in our church. They're like, but as the scripture started to come out, and as we started to open up our hearts, we started to realize that all these truths deal with us as black people as well. And that it's for us. And they, they, they went deeper and started to talk about some of the biases that they feel like they've struggled with on their side and God started to open up their eyes to it. And they said, just so you know, Pastor, make sure that you're speaking to us as well. It's okay for you to speak to us as well. Is it okay for me to speak all, all of you today? Yes. Yeah, it's good. I, I loved their example. I loved their open hearts. Do you see too how that was opening up their heart to me? That was them giving themselves to me 
relationally, I thought that was precious. Um, there's a problem um, in all of this. And it's, the problem is really what today's message is all about. When it comes to people that are in our in-group versus people that are outside of our group, we can agree intellectually that we're supposed to love those people. But sometimes it's hard to love those people. We can agree that we're supposed to treat them like we treat everybody, but it's sometimes hard to do that because sometimes our emotions get in the way. And sometimes we just don't feel it. So I want to do a little exercise with us right now. I've got, a, I've got a group of people that are going to be on your screens right now. Do you see them all? It's a small world after all, right? There's, there's, there's a whole lot of people there. And it's kind of easy when they're way far away and very small. Now let's zoom in a little bit. Zoom in a bit more. Now there's a group of people. Here's what I want you to do practically right now is I want you to start scanning across the top row and, and, and keep scanning down through those faces until you find a person, until you find a face that makes you uncomfortable. Until you find a face where it's like, you know what? I, I mean, I'm for them and, and philosophically I get it and all this, but, but if I walked into a room and only those kinds of people were in that room and I was the only kind of person like me in that room, I might feel a little bit uncomfortable. My blood might start pumping just a little bit more. Or it's like, th th this person's fine, I just don't like them as much. Or this person's fine, but the way I was raised is we're not as close to groups of people like that. They kind of stay in their corner, we kind of stay in ours. Pick your picture. Because I think that picture is where Jesus wants to come and work on you today. I think that's the crack he wants to fill for you. And if, if you would admit to yourself that one of those pictures is you, I think it would help. And it's not just ethnicity, guys. Some of it's young versus old. Some of it's that person looks like a liberal. That person looks like a conservative. That person looks like they're, they're, they're um, uh, LGBT. It could be all kinds of things. Sexual orientation, it could be all kinds of things. But that person I'm not so comfortable around. What if I asked you for the next six months to have that kind of a person over to your house for dinner once a month and to build a friendship that looked like that, where they'd have to come into your sacred place, your dining room, where you'd have to talk to them face to face and get to know them? How would that make you feel? See, this is where rubber starts to hit the road. I mean, it's real now, right? To, to love with action is more real. And how do, what do we do with our feelings with that? Because I feel this way, Pastor. What do I do with those feelings? Can I suddenly feel a closeness with these people in my out group that I never felt before? I don't think you can just suddenly decide to feel closeness with people that you're not close to. I think it takes action. And I think Jesus is going to come in to this very specific problem. He's going to try and solve it. Uh, if I could say it this way, I think one of the things that you need to do is adopt those people who are those people. You need to adopt those people. To adopt somebody is to take someone who is not your family and make them your family. Okay, when I was a kid, we had this couple, my, my mom and dad, they were like best friends, uh, Dale and Barb Rowden. And they were not our family, they were family friends, but they became our godparents. And whenever we went to their house, my mom made us call them Uncle Dale and Aunt Barb. Uncle Dale and Aunt Barb. Why'd you call them that? Because my mom told me to. And we were adopting them. And their kids called my mom Aunt Terry, Uncle Farrell. That's what they called them. We, we made people family that previously were not family. Does that make sense today? We can do that. We can do that as a people. How do we do that? Jesus is going to talk about this. Um, remember the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, self that all men are created and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Man, you all went to school, didn't you? It's awesome. Isn't it amazing the amount of truth that is in that document? 
even though people on a widespread basis were not actually obeying the truth in that document at the time in this country. But there's so much truth there. All men are created equal. There's a creator in view. They are endowed by their creator with certain rights. Every single person, no matter what. And they're given those rights. They don't earn those rights. It's a gift. And they were given by the creator, not because of their skin color, not because they had worked really hard. They were given those rights from day one when they were born. Now, where's this in the scripture? Let's look at this in the scripture. This is Genesis 9, 5 through 6. It says, And I will require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. If wild animals kill a person, it must die. And anyone who murders a fellow human must die. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made human beings in his image. If we could leave that scripture up for just a second. Here's the backstory to that. Some of you guys have heard this teaching on the Imago Dei before. That right in the the very first chapter of Genesis, when God made man and woman, Adam and Eve, it says that he breathed into them the breath of life and he, he made them in his image. And when he made them in his image, we don't know exactly what that mystery means, but we know that it means that they have value and that they have dignity. And when he did that to the very first man and the very first woman, what it tells us is every single race and ethnicity is inside of them. They're the parents of humanity. And so when God made them in, them in his image, he made everyone in his image. So by the time we get to this passage in Genesis 9, this is after Noah's flood. And so all mankind has been killed on the face of the earth through this flood, except Noah and his family. And when they come out of the ark, God makes a new agreement with Noah and his family. And this is part of that covenant that he makes with them. And he says, you are now the new parents of humanity. And because of that, I'm letting you know that, listen, if an animal kills another animal, do you know what we say? We say that's animals being animals. But if someone kills another human being, we say that's murder. Why? Why do we say that's murder? Because it has weight to it. Why does it have weight to it with humanity? Because they're made in the image of God. And we know that there is value and that there is dignity there that must be honored. And that is in every single race. So that, that, that picture up on the screen that you struggle with, we've got to begin there. We've got to begin with realizing that they are formed in the image of God. And that from birth, they don't have to earn it. They don't have to earn anything from you or from me. These, they were given these things by God and they have to be respected. Um, Now, the next part is where Jesus comes in and he tells us how to make someone our neighbor. Uh, This is Luke chapter 10, verse 25. It says, One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. I love when people tested Jesus. It was always fun, wasn't it? He asked him this question, uh, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, What does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. That's number one. And number two commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus another question. And who is my neighbor? Now pause there. Why is he doing this? Because Jesus has just held up this huge standard that you don't just have to endure your neighbors, you have to love your neighbors. And love, if you think about it, is a huge standard. I've got to love these people? So what does he do? He's looking for a way out here. He's trying to limit the impact of this huge command on his life. So maybe I can shrink the group of people that I'm responsible to love. Doesn't that make sense? Isn't that what we want to do? Who is my neighbor then, Jesus? Define it for me. Because once you define it for me, maybe it's a small group of people that I like. It's a small group of people that that they look like me and they talk like me. And yeah, I'll love them, God. And I'll fulfill your law by loving them. And so would you define, Jesus, who my neighbor is? And Jesus does. Here we go. Verse 30. Jesus replied with a story. He's such a good pastor. He replied with a story. 
I love stories. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, and they beat him up, and they left him half dead beside the road. Do you know what story we're in right now? The Good Samaritan. So the Jewish man is traveling on the road to Jericho, and he gets attacked, left for dead. And some people are going to come up and walk past in verse 31. By chance, a priest came along. And if you know the story, you know that the, the priest, the man of God, the religious person, this person just walks on the opposite side and does not help the man who's been left for dead. Verse 32, a temple assistant, that's a Levite, he walks over. He actually, he actually runs over to the man to check on him re really quickly. And for some reason, even though this guy is bleeding and in such a bad state, after he sees him, he walks away and doesn't help. It's like, what kinds of excuses were going through those people's minds? We're really busy. We've got bigger things to do. I can't get my hands dirty. Maybe someone else will come and attack me. They probably had all kinds of excuses, right? But regardless of what their excuses were, they didn't help the guy. And then a despised Samaritan comes along. And it's the Samaritan that helps the man out. And the Samaritan not only scoops the guy up, puts him on his donkey, gets him to an inn where he can start to heal up, but he gives the innkeeper some money and says, take care of this guy until he's fully healed. He totally takes care of him. And he's a despised Samaritan. Why, why are they despised? They're despised if you know the history. Because you go back in the Old Testament, there was a time when God's people were sent into exile. That means all of God's people, the Jews, were all carted off to a different country and they had to live in a different place in exile. Now, there were a few Jews that were left behind in Jerusalem, just a few. And those people, because there weren't many other of their countrymen around, they intermarried with Philistines and other people that, that were around them, other Gentiles that were around them. And from that point forward, those were considered the Samaritans. They were considered mixed race. They were considered half-breeds. They were considered a questionable religion. They had some of the things about Yahweh, but not all the things about Yahweh. And when the Jews finally came back into their land, they saw, them as, saw themselves as pure, saw themselves as righteous, not like these Samaritans. So Jesus makes a hero to his story, and he makes his hero a Samaritan. Blows my mind. Verse 36. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who, who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. So according to Jesus, the hero, the person who was the neighbor, was a Samaritan, was someone who was a different race, was of someone who was of, of a different even religious disposition. He crossed all those lines. Jesus elevates somebody who crossed all those lines and went into his outgroup in order to help somebody. Do you love that today? I love the way our Lord thinks today. The other thing that's so interesting is the guy said, Jesus, would you limit the number of people that I have to love? And what does Jesus do? He doesn't define it as a, here's a group of people that you can, you can describe with exterior adjectives and those are the only people that you have to love. Instead, he gives the guy a story where someone chooses to make somebody their neighbor. They choose to make somebody their neighbor. He says, you want to know who a neighbor is? It's whoever you choose to make your neighbor. And oh, by the way, that means you ought to choose to make everybody your neighbor. Because the choice is always yours. All this in-group stuff and out-group stuff, those are human constructs in our mind and in our society. And God doesn't see any of those. We push past it. We choose to love people. And when we choose to love people, an adoption process starts. You choose to love people and they start to become neighbor. They start to become family. Do you see what Jesus is doing? It's so good. So what does it mean to make somebody our neighbor? Let's get practical for us today. What are some practical things that we can do to help people be our neighbor? First one is to celebrate their color. Celebrate their color. Celebrate their ethnicity. Now, I know it's politically correct to say I don't see color. And I've said that phrase myself before. But I think it was a year or two we were preaching on uh, the book of Jonah. And 
Jonah, if you've never read that book, it's, it's, it's a lot about racism, as a matter of fact, um, because you had the Ninevites, and Jonah hated them. That's why he ran away, and that's why he was swallowed by the whale. The whole thing is actually driven by racism. It's really interesting. So we were talking about racism in there, and I don't even remember what I said in this particular sermon, but as I was on my way out that morning, not, I'll sometimes stand back there and like shake people's hands and stuff, but this woman, her name's Wendy. She comes walking up to me, big old smile on her face, and she says, Pastor, please don't say you don't see color. Ugh. And she was all smiles and respectful and nice about it. But when she said, please don't say you don't see color, you know where my mind went? You know what? I try so hard to be politically correct, okay? Would everybody just lay off of me? I try to think about this stuff, okay? I, I, try, to, I try to read. I try to stay up, and sometimes, sometimes this politically correct thing and what words we can use, what phrases we can use, it feels like a moving target. Does it ever feel like a moving target? It feels like a moving target, and, and, and what I start to feel is kind of whiny on the inside and kind of self-pity, and, and, and it's, it's, it's the ugliest part about me, by the way. It's my self-pity, and I was starting to feel that, but she wasn't attacking me. She said, Pastor, instead of saying you don't see color, why, why don't you say you celebrate color? I had no idea what she meant. None. Took me a while to figure this out. Because at first, again, self-pity and all this kind of stuff, I just assumed this is just not the politically correct flavor of the day, so we're, so we're moving on. But I had to think about it some more, meditate on it some more. One of the things I started to realize is that every ethnicity brings with it a group of blessings, and a group of burdens. If, if you're black today, there are blessings and burdens connected to your ethnicity. If you grew up Latino, you grew up white, you grew up Pacific Islander, you grew, ain't, there are blessings and there are burdens. Would you agree? And so when I walk up to you and I say, I don't see color, first off, sure I do. So first off, it's just not true, Right? You might be like, is that the same thing you say to the white people that you walk up to? I don't see your whiteness today. Why would you say that? It's because I recognized it that I might say it. And again, my heart's in the right place. But what, what I'm trying to say is I, I promise not to treat you any differently based on your color. It's what I'm trying to say in my clumsiness. But what I really end up doing is, first off, it's not true. But the other thing is I'm shutting down any conversation about color is I'm saying anything that's a blessing or a burden that is attached to your ethnicity, I'm not willing to talk about it. This is going to be the topic we never talk about. It shuts a door. Oh, I, it's not what I wanted to do, but it's what I was doing. And so we uncovered a little bias there in me, and it needed to be worked on, and I needed to change that. Can I tell you about a conversation I had with my barber? And this was, this was a few months ago. It was when George Floyd was murdered. Um, I, I go to this barber shop and it's a black barber shop. And I say it because most of the barbers are black in there. And, and I walked in and felt a little ins in in inconspicuous the first time. Um, but super welcoming, super great. I sit down and, and this guy's cutting my hair and, and um, we're talking. And again, everything about George Floyd was just in the air. And so we started to talk about it. And I mentioned to him that our church was considering, we were considering doing a series on racism to talk about this. Now, again, this guy's, he's super smart. He's a business owner, right? He, he's great at what he does. He's also around my age. His kids are around my age. So we would constantly talk about how our kids are doing and our parenting flubs and all this kind of stuff. So we had several things in common and he's just an easy guy to talk to. But I said, we're about to do this series. And he took that as an open door to talk about color. And he jumped right in and he told me this story. And he grew up about two hours from where I grew up. He grew up up, up in Chicago area. And he told me about when he was in high school and, and, and his basketball team, he was on the basketball team, and they played another town. And when they, when they played another town, they were an all-black team and they played against this all-white town. And the game did not go well. And they beat them really bad. Okay? The score was... Yeah. 
and no big deal. He's a high school kid, plays basketball. He had some fun. But some police showed up after the game was over and told the black basketball team, we've got to lock you in your locker room for the next few hours. They said, because the townspeople are so upset and angry right now, we fear things are turning violent. And we fear that you might get hurt. Now, I'm, I'm not speaking against the police. They were doing that in order to protect them. But why should high school basketball players get subjected to that kind of hate? Come on. And I heard this story from him. And by the way, I talked, talked to, uh, to Trey um, this past Friday. He said he might be watching today online. So Trey, if you're listening, thank you for honoring me with your story, trusting me with your story. I don't think I ever would have heard that from him unless we opened up the door of race conversation. And I don't think I would have learned from him unless we opened up that door together. And I got to tell you, it blew me away because I'm from the enlightened north, which is a joke, by the way. I'm from the enlightened north. And we don't have racism up there. Racism is from the, like the 1950s and pockets in the south and and crazy kind of white people I don't understand, and it's, it's all that kind of stuff. It's not where I lived. It's not where I grew up, and it's not when I was growing up, because this happened in 1992. This is when I was graduating high school. Oh, it made me uncomfortable. Does that make you uncomfortable? You have to open up the door with people in order to learn what the truth is. Because the Holy Spirit wants to use them in your life to teach you something. And again, I'm thankful that that person, trust, Trey, trusted me. It's real. Next is pursue justice for them. This is a tricky one. Pursue justice for people who do not look like you. Pursue justice for people who are in your outgroup. Look at this. This is Deuteronomy 24, 17. It says, True justice must be given to foreigners living among you and to orphans, and you must never accept a widow's garment as security for her debt. I've got several of these to read to you. Psalm 82, 3. Give justice to the poor and the orphan. Uphold the rights of the oppressed and the destitute. Now, it's interesting. If you make an honest read of the Old Testament, you will see this ethic all over the Old Testament. So when God had his chosen people and he set up the government of the Israelites, do you know he wove this sensitivity into, about the oppressed? He wove it into the whole society. It's all over the laws. It's even to the point, if you've ever read the book of Ruth, and we preached on this a few years ago, you ever read the book of Ruth, what the farmers were supposed to do when they went and they went to plow their field and they went to harvest their grain, you know what they're supposed to do? They're supposed to make that one pass and any of the stuff that was left over, the grain that did not get picked up the first time, or the grain that was on the outsides, they were supposed to leave it there. Because the poor or the foreigner might come along and need to eat something. So they were supposed to not be so capitalistic that they wanted every single cent out of their fields. They were supposed to leave it for the poor. It was woven in to God's perspective. Even debt, they could only actually keep in debt for a certain amount of time, and that God mandated all debts are forgiven. The year of Jubilee, all debts forgiven. Because we're not going to take, take these people that have found themselves in a bad place and keep them down. Justice is woven in. Here's some more verses. Proverbs 31.9. Yes, speak up for the poor and the helpless and see that they get justice. I think sometimes... In our current culture, we have forgotten that this is part of what God has wanted for his people, is that we are responsible. That when something comes up in the news, and we're like, well, my party's acting like that doesn't exist, or my party's acting like this was actually this person's fault, not that person's fault, or there's an explanation for this. We are supposed to get involved, according to scripture. Isaiah 1.17, learn to do good, seek justice, help the oppressed, Defend the cause of orphans. Fight for the rights of widows. 
This next one is about God and what he does, Isaiah 11:4. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. Who are the exploited in our society? The earth will shake at the force of his word, and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked, Isaiah 58, 6. No, this is the kind of fasting that I want, says God. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Hold on. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned? Wait, so God knows that sometimes prisons make mistakes and judges and police? Sometimes, yes. And he speaks to it specifically in his word and says, as the people of God, we should care. Hold on. But my group, whenever one of these accusations gets made, my group always believes the accused and we all just get on board. My group, we don't believe the accused. We believe there must have been a reason for their imprisonment. It must have been that person's fault somehow. That's what my group always says. Third option. Your allegiance is not to those groups. Third option says free those who are wrongly imprisoned. I should care. Maybe I should read. Maybe I should dig a little bit deeper and not just give what my, what, what my group is telling me. Next, be a real friend minus the eggshells. Be a real friend. Before this series, and I talked about this on Sunday. Some of you guys know we did this on, on a Friday night. We had a race conversation here at this church, and we invited several black families from our church, several white families from our church into a room, and we talked for about two hours and just sharing things. Very enlightening. I learned a ton that night. Here's just one thing that I learned. I'll have more for you next week. Here's just one thing that I learned that night, and it was right near the end, and, and, and one of our sisters in this church, and she's black, she turned to me at one point and said, please stop walking on eggshells. And she said, because when you walk on eggshells, bad things start to happen. What do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is sometimes you come into the conversation and you're watching so carefully what you say. And you're trying to get everything right. And the goal of the conversation becomes, I want to get to the end of this conversation with this person of a different race than me. And I want to be able to know that I said everything right. And I didn't do anything wrong. And guys, that being right is a very low standard. Jesus calls us to love, not to be right. And part of the problem is when I'm being so careful, and she, boy, she just pegged me, okay? This, this was me. Of, of everything in this message, this is the piece that cut me to the quick the most. See, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm trying to say everything right, trying to do everything right, it's self-protective and it shuts down any kind of friendship because it's based on fear. And I'm treating this person like they're a potential attacker. Isn't that what I'm doing? And you can't be a friend at that level. See, friends put down their weapons with each other. Friends take chances with each other. Friends are honest. Ugh. But if I do that, if I do that, if I just run in there and I just start talking like I normally talk, I might make a mistake. And they're, they're going to come and they're going to bring the hammer down on me. So what? Take the chance. And, and, and I would say, if, if you're the person becoming friends with somebody in this church and they're of a different race and they say something clumsy, they say something that reveals a secret bias, be kind. Speak up. But be kind and give love and grace on both sides. But here's the thing. I will make friends I never had before and I will learn more about myself than I ever have before. And more of my secret biases will be exposed and dealt with in Jesus' name. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that the standard? Make people your neighbor. 
they're not my neighbor today. Make them your neighbor. And the feelings will follow. It's amazing. You'll take action and the feelings will follow, but it's got to be real. And you got to open up the door on color. You got to talk about it. And don't walk on eggshells with them. Make sense? Would you guys stand right now? I told you I was going to push on you. You all right? Everybody okay? It doesn't help us if we just came to church to listen and then we go to lunch. I say this a lot because it's true. What will change you is the things that you choose to walk in. So you remember that picture you identified at the very beginning, that out group for you? What is God calling you to do with them from this point forward? What kind of friendships are you supposed to build? What kind of risks are you supposed to take? (laughs) Let's pray. Lord God, you're so good to us, Lord. You don't leave us where we've been. You don't leave us broken. But you also don't leave us in denial. God, I pray that you would come and that you would speak that plan, Lord. Speak those steps of obedience that we need to take. Lord, I pray for new friendships all across this church. I pray, Lord, that where people are not our neighbors, we make them our neighbor. God, I pray it'd be real for us. I pray that we would hand down a better legacy to our kids than was handed down to us. I pray, Lord, that in Lawton, Oklahoma, this church would be a better voice than other voices. I pray that we would be a more Christ-like voice. But God, if we're going to do that authentically, it's got to change in us first. So Jesus, would you come and bring a change to this congregation? Lord, we want to grow. In Christ's name, amen. Well, church, we're going to sing together, but before we... We have prayer teams who are in the back. So if you want someone to pray with you, um, go back there, and I, I know that they would love to do that. Love you. If you're online, we love you. We hope you have a great week and be blessed.